So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Washington Foreign Press Center's briefing on the release of the best practices for the Washington Conference Principles on Nazi Confiscated Art. My name is Jake Gosher. I'm the moderator for this briefing. As a reminder, the briefing is on the record. We will post a transcript of the briefing and a video on our website at fpc.state.gov. For the journalists joining us via Zoom today, please make sure to take a moment to rename yourself with your name, your country, and your outlet so we know who is joining us. Um, our distinguished briefers today include Ellen Germain, the Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues at the U.S. State Department, Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, the Special Advisor to the Secretary of State Blinken on Holocaust Issues, Gideon Taylor, the President of the World Jewish Reconstruction Organization and Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, and Lord Eric Pickles, the United Kingdom's Special Envoy on Post-Holocaust Issues. Before their opening remarks, one quick reminder, views expressed by briefers not affiliated with the Department of State are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the department or the U.S. government. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Envoy Germain to begin us with some opening remarks. Okay, thanks very much, Jake. This is on and working, yeah, okay. So um, I'm gonna talk about, uh, this morning we held an event at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum to mark the 25th anniversary of the Washington Conference Principles on Nazi Confiscated Art. And uh, the purpose of this was to provide some momentum to the process of restitution and compensation for art that was seized, looted by the Nazis from Jews and others during World War II. And unfortunately, almost 80 years since the end of World War II, um, that process of restitution and compensation is still unfinished. And so one of the big things we did this morning was we introduced a best practices document, best practices for implementing the Washington principles. And that document, <clears throat> the best practices, is the result of some very intense international collaboration among countries that have appointed a special envoy or its equivalent, like myself and like my colleague, Lord Pickles of the UK, um, someone to deal specifically with Holocaust issues. And as of this morning, we had 22 states endorsing the best practices document, and we are continuing to encourage other countries to do so. And so this informal, uh, Special Envoys for Holocaust Issues Network was started in 2023 by the World Jew Jewish Restitution Organization, um, the, United, the United Kingdom, and the US um, to try to deal more effectively with remaining issues of Holocaust era restitution. And um, in our first two meetings, which were last year in London and then here in Washington, um, we decided to take the landmark 1998 Washington principles as a starting point and think about what we could do to try to reinforce their importance and their utility. And so we thought it would be useful to examine the lessons learned in the last 25 years of applying the Washington principles and try to develop a set of legally non-binding best practices that would help implement these fundamental and timeless principles of art restitution. And that seemed like a really appropriate way to mark the 25th anniversary of the Washington principles and to highlight how important it is to resolve remaining claims. Because restitution and compensation for a property that was seized by the Nazis um, matters not only because it can provide a measure of justice for Holocaust survivors and their heirs, but also because it shows perpetrators that there are consequences for their actions. And so making sure that there are processes and that there are widely accepted principles for implementing restitution and compensation is the real world application of rule of law to those who used anti-Semitism as an excuse to murder six million Jews, as well as to perpetrate the greatest theft in history. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. I wanna make two major points about this 25th anniversary 
of the Washington principles on Nazi confiscated art, which I was uh, instrumental in negotiating. First, while what much remains to be done, and to show what remains to be done, estimates are that over 100,000 of the 600,000 paintings and many more of the millions of books, manuscripts, ritual, religious items, and other cultural objects stolen have never been returned. And yet, this is also a time to reflect a satisfaction at how much has been accomplished. When we negotiated the Washington Principles in 1998, skeptics immediately felt that they would have no effect since they were purely voluntarily, voluntary and non-legally binding. In fact, they have totally transformed the art world beyond anything we could have imagined creating a moral and ethical obligation on holders of Nazi looted art to return them. They stand in a way as a symbol of what international principles, even if not legally binding, can do if they have a sound foundation. Let me give you examples of what has been accomplished. Thousands of Nazi looted artworks and tens of thousands of books and religious objects have been restituted or compensated. In addition, we have strengthened the, two, the Washington Principles by the 2009 Theresen Declaration to include forced sales, forced sales, and sales under duress, because oftentimes these were necessary in order for people trying to exit Germany to get uh, exit visas and pay for them, and by the 2022 to raise in two conference. Third, the WJRO survey, which Gideon will talk about, indicates seven countries have made major progress in implementing them and three others substantial progress. In addition, five European nations, Austria, France, Germany, Netherlands, and the UK, have established formal art restitution commissions to help resolve claims to Nazi looted art. They now publish their decisions, and they form for the first time a network to share experiences, in effect creating the beginning of a body of precedence. Next, no longer can you simply rely upon your immediate seller, but provenance research has to be done for the full history of any art, particularly if it went through European hands between 1933 and 1945. It's created a whole new profession of Holocaust provenance researchers and more broadly of research uh, provenance experts. Next, Christie's and Sotheby's, the two great auction houses, have full-time staffs that vet all paintings passing through European hands between 1933 and 1945. They've totally changed their whole consignment contracts giving them the right to hold and not sell anything with a cloud on it. They've satisfactorily resolved over 300 claims. In addition, a number of countries have recently strengthened their implementation of the Washington Principles, including France, which just passed a deaccession law allowing their public museums to deaccess art. Their state senate uh, allowed 15 paintings uh, to be uh, restituted. But in addition, the Netherlands ended their balancing test, which had allowed their museums to keep Nazi looted art if they had a greater interest in keeping it than the claimants. That's now ended. Belgium has made real progress recently, and Luxembourg agreed on a major restitution program. And Germany is considering legislation to do so. Last and very important going forward is what I call the ripple effect of the Washington Principles, something I have to say we never could have imagined, uh, not only in 1998, but even a couple of years ago, by which I mean the impact of the concept of the Washington Principles has led to the beginning of returning colonial era art from colonialist countries. Germany, for example, recently gave back two 
priceless Benin bronzes to Nigeria. France has set up a special office and the prime minister's office to look at their uh, colonial era work, uh, possessions, and so have the Netherlands. And recently, UCLA's Fowler Museum, just within the last week, literally within the last week, inspired by the Washington principles, but not obligated by them, researched all of their uh, provenance and returned a whole set of artworks from Ghana that had been taken by the British. The Smithsonian Museum, just uh, a stone's throw from here, is going through their entire exhibition to look at any that have suspicious origin. So that's the first point. The second is the best practices themselves released today, which as Ellen mentioned, have been endorsed by 22 nations. They are a tribute to the vision and determination of the WJRO under the leadership of Gideon Taylor and Mark Weitzman and their team, Lord Eric Pickles of the UK and his team, and our State Department led by Ellen Germain. They have worked tirelessly for a year since the first meeting in London and have created a new special envoy network of nations. And we expect that that which is met once in London, once in Washington, and I won't announce it ourselves, but we have a country that volunteered one of the 14 to host the next special envoy network. The whole point was to clarify fundamental points in implementing the Washington principles. And these include the following. Washington principles refer not just to art, but to other cultural property of Holocaust and other victims of Nazi persecution. Nazi confiscated and Nazi looted refer not only to what was taken by the Nazis, but also by other fascists and their collaborators. Next, they refer to individual and communal property. There are a lot who said, well, the Washington principles didn't apply to private collections. They did, but this clarifies and makes it clear that they should, and communal property, that is property owned by the Jewish communities, like synagogues, Torah scrolls, ritual objects, kiddish cups, and the like. And such communal property should be returned to an existing communal institution and, where appropriate, also to an Israeli institution, if that is an appropriate designation for them, where other Jewish cultural heritage already exists. In addition, the best practices indicate that countries should consider reducing barriers to recovery from accession laws, statute of limitations, latches, and other restrictions. They recognize the best practices that provenance research is seminal to the entire process and must be more strongly supported. Gideon, I'm sure, will go into detail about this. And the key phrase in the Washington principles, just and fair solutions, that was principle eight of the 11 principles that we developed in 1998. That means first and foremost, as the best practices indicate, that the just and fair solutions are for victims and their heirs, not the holders of confiscated art. The primary just and fair solution should be restitution, although there can be other creative ways, compensation, long-term loans, and the like. So the long and the short of it is that these best practices released today underscore our strong and continued commitment to accelerate our progress in implementing the Washington principles and will add momentum to doing so. Okay, thank you. I'm privileged to be here with uh, um, folks who've played such a major role uh, in this issue. Um, I think a couple of points I just wanted to make briefly. Firstly, I think what's particularly important about this issue of art and cultural property is that it's not just about the very well-known, world-renowned uh, paintings hanging in major museums. This issue is about ordinary items, small things, an etching, a drawing, uh, a shofar, a Torah scroll, uh, everything that went into the culture of the Jewish people. 
Um, the report that was issued today uh, by the World Jewish Restitution Organization and the Claims Conference, and we'll ask Jake to make sure that that's available to you if you haven't seen it, and we're going to circul circulate the link to it. Uh, just very quickly, five main general findings. Firstly, that most countries have carried out at least some historical research, so we certainly know a lot more than we did. Secondly, the provenance research on individual items has grown greatly and become more advanced. However, Museums in many countries continue to ignore the need for provenance research, and in most countries, it's still not seen as an essential part of museum practice. Thirdly, the claims processes are now in place in many countries, but the numbers of cases handled and the resulting restitutions remain low. There are, um, as Stu mentioned, five countries that have established uh, restitution commissions, but most have not. Um, fourthly, um, the Washington Conference principles have focused, um, as you heard, on public collections, far less progress relating to items that are currently in private hands. Fifthly, there's much greater awareness now of the special status of cultural property that belong to Jewish communities, not to individuals, but to Jewish communities, um, and, but in many cases that still remains in private hands. So overall, of the 47 countries that were surveyed in the report, um, seven have made major progress, as you heard. Three have made substantial progress. Thirteen had made some progress. And 24 countries have made little or no progress. Um, that's sort of the overall picture of, of where we're at. Substantial progress, but a long way to go, in summary. Um, and finally, on the best practices, uh, I think for us, the WGRO represents the Jewish community, the Jewish world, and Holocaust survivors. Um, and for us, the be best practices are a roadmap. They're a roadmap to the future. They're the next step forward, and they tell us how we, in a wider uh, community of governments, of auction houses, of private owners, of individuals involved in the world of art and culture, can move forward, can take um, the challenge that was laid down by the Washington Principles uh, and take it to a place where we can start to make significant impact beyond where we've got today. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Eric Pickles. I'm delighted uh, uh, to be here. And I think you need to understand that these, uh, this confiscation, this looting, wasn't a byproduct of the Holocaust. It was a fundamental part of the Holocaust. The Nazis were essentially thieves. They stole your identity, they stole your property, they stole your house, they stole your job, they stole everything from you. And when, because there's no honor among thieves, they stole from each other. And we should bear in mind that this was um, an important part of the Nazi economies, street auctions and the like. So we go back to the point that that Gideon was making. It's possible we might be looking for Picasso's. It's possible we might be looking for the permanent. But that isn't the main purpose. It's these small things. It's maybe a book with a name on the flycover. And that's the only evidence that your great-grandmother ever existed. It's the only proof of life. It might be a <coughs> small candelabra used as a Shabbat or a, or a pen and the like. Now if they've taken you Picasso, it's pretty obvious because it's up on a wall. But if they've taken a small item, that's almost certainly going to be in storage. And that's why it's important to get good understanding of what museums have what's in what is there in public uh, collections and we uh, and we need to be we need to be part of the process that you look at providence as a process of uh, if it's been through that so that people can look and can see readily where their property is number number of um, uh, countries publish um, a property but do research, but don't publish it. And what we're seeking is to recognize that sunshine is the best medicine, that transparency works, that it's a way of 
of getting that information out there. People can't find their property unless they, they know where it is. And, and, and uh, the final thing is that perhaps resolutions have been too litigious, too expensive for ordinary people to take on board. And the thing that where um, countries that have commissions have the advantage is it's a process of mediation. And mediation is a much better way of resolving this than lengthy and expensive law cases, which you're trying to get back your property that's been stolen from you, having to pay to get it back, does seem to me to be breach of, uh, of, of natural justice. Thank you. Thank you all for those uh, opening remarks. We're now going to open the session up for questions. For the journalists joining us on Zoom, please make sure you rename yourself with your name, country, and outlet. And if you have questions on Zoom, please raise your virtual hand with the raise a hand icon. But we'll start here in the room. If anyone in the room has any questions, Stephanie, and please introduce yourself. Stephanie Bolson, I'm the uh, Washington correspondent for the base. Um, first question to Ellen Germain. Um, you said um, you were looking for momentum today at the conference. Uh, first of all, why does this need momentum? And secondly, um, you were talking about legally non-binding approaches. But if you look at the slow progress, wouldn't it be better to have legally binding approaches? And to Lord Pickles, if I may, um, why do you think our museum so reluctant to uh, allow the sun shine into their uh, back stores. Thank you. Okay. Um, on why we still need momentum, um, I think there are. We've addressed some of the reasons. Um, there's a lot of ignorance about. First of all, where artwork and other cultural objects have ended up, what their history was, who they belonged to, and that's why the stress on provenance research that the best practices have is so important. It's important to shed light, as Lord Pickles said, um, figure out where objects were, what is their history, can we, you know, make public all the information that we know about their history, not only in the last you know, 10 years, 20 years, but since the 1930s. Um, so one reason momentum is slow is just that there's not a lot of knowledge about what was the origin and the provenance of many articles that are now in public, you know, public collections, in private hands. And so the best practices are an effort to kind of give a, a bit of a you know kick in the pants to efforts to speed up and focus governments, private institutions, you know, uh, auction houses, museums, um, all those who are interested in trying to, as I keep saying, achieve a measure of justice for Holocaust survivors and their heirs, and for all um, whose, you know, whose possessions were seized by the Nazis during, uh, during World War II. So it's always necessary to refocus um, the world on an issue like this, and the 25th anniversary of the Washington Principles seemed like the right time to do it. On legally, not, these are legally non-binding principles um, and they are legally non-binding because we're trying to get the greatest possible, trying to find the best possible balance between getting the most buy-in to these principles and making the principles practical and implementable. And I, th I think um, we've done a pretty good job of acknowledging that countries have different legal systems and obviously have to be bound by those. But at the same time, these are pretty specific best practices that um, are, yes, legally non-binding, but morally and ethically important. And they 
state straight out some, to me, some things that seem obvious but needed stating, like uh, artwork seized by the Nazis doesn't just mean paintings and sculpture. It also means the everyday cultural objects that uh, we've talked about. Um, obvious things like seized by the Nazis doesn't just mean literally um, taken by the Nazis after uh, the Jews were rounded up and deported to ghettos or camps. It also means those forced sales that happened throughout the 1930s and the 1940s. And clarifying fundamental points like that, uh, I think, make it easier for uh, governments, organizations, institutions, and people to uh, actually take action to implement restitution. Well, the announcement is easy because she's likely answered your question for me as well. But we, ne we need to understand that quite a lot of this stuff um, is there in plain sight. It's hidden in plain sight. It's there. And often you might even find references to the fact that it was, uh, it wa it was uh, looted. So why don't people sort of get with the program and say this is a wonderful thing? Well, it involves a lot of work. It's very difficult. And you get the guy coming up from accounts and the guy from the legal and saying, you know, we've got stolen property. If we admit and send it back, it, it, is there some damages? Do we have to pay damages for having returned this? And that's why the, the non-legal binding is really good, because mediation is a good way of resolving that. And remember, we're not always looking for the return of the property. We could be just looking for something simple as a plaque going up to say where the property came from. It could be that we might look for some kind of, uh, of compensation. Mediation gives a lot of flexibility that litigation doesn't. And it's, I think it has proved to be very effective in those countries that have it. I hope that answers your question. Let me give a very practical answer. I couldn't have negotiated it if it was mandatory. After a three-day conference, when the last plenary was about to start, it looked like the whole process was going to collapse because countries did not want the imposition of mandatory restitution on their national laws. And so by making it non-binding, uh, we were able to overcome those objections. Now, that led skeptics to say, well, it'll have no effect. And the fact is that it has had major effect, even though it's not legally binding because of the reputational damage. As one success builds on the other, uh, it has become inappropriate to hold Nazi looted art. And now, as we see with what's happened with the colonial uh, art, to, to hold art confiscated anywhere. So the more visibility, the more transparency we can give, which is what uh, we're all saying is critical for the best practices, the more reputational uh, damage is done to those museums and those private collections that are holding looted art. No one should want to hold something that was looted from Holocaust victims and other victims during the war or looted e even more generally. And so this was a practical judgment and it turned out to be the right one. Philippe de Montebello, who was then the head of the New York uh, Metropolitan Museum, said at the time at the plenary, notwithstanding the fact that it's not binding, it will change the art world forever, and he was right. Just to add one sentence, um, this, these, these uh, best practices are not legally binding, but we believe that what the statement of principle of international consensus will enable us as WGRO, as the claims conference as regards Germany, to seek specific actions, policies, including legislation. So we believe that this sets a moral framework, but certainly that legal actions and steps and policies that will, we will be asking governments to change in accordance with these principles. 
And just just less to add on to that, I've already had one country um, come up to me and say we're interested in trying to put these best practices into legislation, and we'd like to talk to you about that. So um, it leaves open that possibility. And just to clarify, Stu, you were talking, uh, when you were talking about the history just now, that was the, the Washington, Washington principles, principles. Yes. right, 1998, yeah, okay. Done. To begin with, if we didn't have it, uh, you know, voluntary at the very uh, outset. Okay. Yes, can okay. Foreign Policy Magazine. I have two questions. The first is, the, is the, you mentioned private hands. What is the problem there? Is it ignorance, fame, money? Question number one. Question number two is some kind of a maybe a roadmap or blueprint for what's going on now, like looting in Ukraine, that there would be this awareness in the of how to deal with these problems? And that Ellen and the State Department have emphasized is that as we speak, uh, the Russian uh, invasion and aggression against Ukraine has included uh, the destruction of Ukrainian cultural objects and, and, and art. So this is going on as we speak. It's very live. Even though Russia's actually uh, uh, signed on to the Washington Principles, in 1998, and were one of the few countries that passed legislation dealing with it, signed by none other than Vladimir Putin. They just haven't implemented it. But that's just, this is going on right now as part of the war. And I think what Lord Pickles said is so important. It's really important to understand that the confiscation of art, bank accounts, insurance policies, ritual objects, homes, businesses, were part and parcel of the Holocaust. They were not incidental. They were not accidental. They were done with the same systematic effort as the killing of people themselves because the purpose was to destroy the Jewish people root and branch, all aspects. Uh, and so you have to look at the confiscation of art and other property in that context. It was not just incidental. And a significant part of the war effort, uh, Ellen alluded to this, uh, by the uh, Nazi Wehrmacht, was financed with Jewish and other victim assets. Just to answer your question specifically for private property, I think two reasons. One, ignorance, and two, unwillingness. Uh, and I think what this best practices seeks to do is to address both of those, to press for uh, transparency, publication of records, uh, making available of dealer, records of dealers, auction houses, and so on, is addressed in the best practices, um, and also claims processes to make sure that individuals, once they have awareness, once there is this knowledge, have a process uh, to move forward. So that's what lies behind this uh, effort to open up uh, what has been a rather opaque um, market. The art market tends to operate in sometimes uh, with limited transparency. Um, I think that's a key part of the best practices is to open that up um, for, to give information and transparency and to create a way for people to be reconnected with their cultural treasures. Yes, Paul. Uh, Telegraph. Um, as I understand also from, from Secretary Blinken, there are like uh, millions of, of, of objects of art still unaccounted for or not going to be given back. Is, is there um, a, a figure of how many of those objects are actually known where they are but have not been given back? given back, uh, for instance, uh, in, in our museums, the, uh, a big part in, in that, that's that's one of my questions. And the second one, being from the Netherlands, is there anything that, as I understand, the, the, the Dutch government has made some some remarkable steps, but is there anything else they, they didn't do yet that you would recommend that the, the Dutch government uh, still has to, to make progress? Thank you. So on the numbers, uh, 
the best estimates from experts are that 600,000 works of art were stolen. Um, the best of those were to be in a Führer museum in Linz, Austria, which was Hitler's birthplace. Uh, in addition, on cultural objects, the, the most precious were to be in a museum to a dead race in Prague. Of the 600,000, the so-called monuments men, the art curators uh, who were embedded into the U.S. Army as they went east to Berlin, uh, got around 100,000 of those pieces, cataloged them, and then under uh, direction of President Truman in a military order, return, repatriated them, not to the individuals who owned them, because in the chaos of war it was impossible to know, but to the countries from which they were taken, and they, in turn, were supposed to deal with. So, for example, in France, some 60,000 paintings were repatriated. Of that 60,000, around 45,000 were ultimately returned to owners, but the balance uh, were sold, auctioned, or put into their MNR collection. So what happened just within the last couple of months is when the French Senate uh, de-accessed 15 artworks, that was part of the so-called MNR collection. The same thing happened in, in the Netherlands and, and, and in other countries. Now, again, it is estimated that there are another 100,000 unaccounted for of that 600,000 and even more of books and ritual objects and, and the like. Uh, it's, it's impossible to know the location of those, and that's why everyone has said, Lord Pickles and Gideon and Ellen, that the key is transparency and provenance research. It's letting people know where they are so that they can potentially make claims. If there's no provenance research done, there's no way for a potential heir to know to even make a claim. And once they make a claim, there are, as Lord Pickle said, many creative ways beyond restitution, compensation. Uh, in, in the Searle case in Chicago, the University of the Chicago Art Institute of a famous painting, uh, one of the solutions was that the uh, museum paid part of the value and the original owner, the heir of the owner, allowed the museum to keep the balance. So there are all sorts of creative things that can be done, and Christie's and Sotheby's have come up with those kinds of creative solutions as well, but the key is, is the visibility. And if that is not done, then this recedes into the mists of history, and it's impossible to know where they are. I know we've very little time. Why don't we afterwards talk about the Netherlands? So we'll... Uh... Okay. We do have a question online from Alex. Alex, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question on camera if you can. Yes, uh, Jack, thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Alex Rafolu from uh, Tran News Agency. I thank the speakers for their time. Uh, we have seen a list of states uh, endorsing the best practices uh, as of today. There are 22 of them, if I am not mistaken, that includes the United States. Can you speak to uh, some of the countries that are, you have been invited uh, or you have been working with who are refusing to endorse it? And if there's any reasoning you could share with us, I would appreciate that. And secondly, uh, regarding the timing of it, the secretary mentioned in his speech that Holocaust you know, distortion is on the rise. And, and he, he said that efforts to, to resolve restitution claims are now more important than ever. Can you expand a little bit expand on that? You know, given the narratives that we are hearing from Moscow, Tehran, and other capitals these days, um, how, how how significant it is to have these best principles sorted out uh, now? Thank you so much. Yeah, um, on the countries that have endorsed so far, um, really, it's a an artifact of how we started the discussions on the best practices. Um, as I mentioned about a year ago, the WJRO, the United Kingdom, and the United States, um, we were talking and we thought it would be useful to try to set up an informal network of special envoys, representatives who deal specifically with Holocaust issues. And so we gathered the group of countries that have uh, envoys or representatives 
um, who specifically deal with Holocaust issues. And that was the group that, and there were about 14 of those countries. Um, and that was the group that started uh, first the informal discussions, and then we came upon the, we decided that drawing up a best practices for the Washington principles um, would be a way to, good way to provide some momentum for restitution and uh, mark the 25th anniversary. So we started with the, the 14 countries were the ones who uh, discussed and drafted the best principles document. Um, but once we had all reached agreement on that, um, we of course want as many countries as possible to endorse it. We don't say sign, et cetera, because as we've said a number of times, it's legally non-binding. But um, the best practices provide really helpful guidelines, practical uh, definitions of how to go forward with art restitution. So they're still, it's still open for endorsement. Um, we are hoping and expecting that more countries will endorse the best practices in the coming days and weeks. And um, yeah, um, so that's how, how the numbers in the countries came about. Um, and I think... Oh, and then the other, the other, the your second question was why is distortion um, such an issue now, and why is it important in this context? And I think, again, it speaks to what we've been talking about as far as transparency, openness, and telling the truth. I mean, we need to tell the truth about what happened, where items came from, what their history was how they were stolen, how they were seized. And all of that is one way for us as, uh, you know, democracies that believe in the rule of law to show that disinformation and distortion like, holo like uh, you know, Holocaust denial, Holocaust distortion, those are, uh, you know, obviously wrong, bad, we condemn them, and they are things that have become so, have become weaponized in some ways, and part of our uh, response to that is to speak the truth, to tell the truth, and to, uh, you know, shed some sunlight on uh, provenance on stolen items and on the whole process of trying to do restitution or compensation. Okay. And seeing no more questions, we will go ahead and end the Q&A session there. I'm going to turn it over to our panelists now for any uh, last thoughts. We'll start in here with the Special Envoy, Jermaine. I feel as though I've, I've pretty much said everything that... Uh, I was hoping to say, just to say that this is the start of a process. Um, uh, this is indeed um, the best practices document is not an end, it's a beginning to um, provide momentum, provide that, that push to uh, all of us to do better on restitution and compensation for artwork, cultural objects that were stolen during World War II and to find the creative solutions that allow survivors and their heirs to receive some kind of acknowledgement that this great wrong was done. I think that the way to look at this is that we went 25 years taking uh, voluntary, non-legally binding principles and really giving uh, flesh to them, having a lot of progress, uh, but we realized that we needed a new burst of momentum. And the 25th anniversary gives us that opportunity. This should be looked at not as a sprint, but as a marathon. And we are dedicated to run that marathon as long as it takes to do more and more justice. The more visibility this issue has, the more ripple effects it will have. The more ripple effects it has, the more waves will be created. Uh, and the more countries 
will feel that they have to do the right thing too. So this gives us a launching pad now to fill in some of the gaps because some of these were unknown uh, questions. Where, you know, what did we mean by, by looted art? Um, you know, what kind of provenance research needed to be done? Um, what should we do, do with uh, accession laws and the like? And this tries to clarify that and to undergird it and therefore to strengthen, not replace, but to strengthen the Washington principle. And I think, again, this will hopefully give us a new momentum. And you can play a very important role, too, by letting your readers and your listeners understand what happened today and the importance of it. Uh, we depend on you to transmit this so that we do get a new burst of momentum and we, we take a second breath in our marathon race. I think today, ultimately, is not just about the restitution of property, it's about the restitution of history. And that, I think, is what makes this unique, it makes it significant. Um, it's about uh, property, but it's about memory and culture and helping connect families and the Jewish people uh, with their history, uh, which in turn tells us uh, where we came from and who we are. We're not in a post-Holocaust world. As long as this injustice exists, the Holocaust will continue to claw at our conscience. But there is a simple three-step approach for us to, to, to deal with that. And I have to say, it doesn't matter which order we take these three steps, the result is the same. The first is transparency. The second one is transparency, and the third one is transparency. There needs to be a real commitment to getting the truth out there. No one has anything to fear from the truth, and it makes a lot of sense to ensure that we know what museums have and what their provenance is. If we do that, we'll make a very big difference. Thank you all for joining us today, and thank you to the journalists for joining us as well. This ends our briefing. Thank you.